Welcome to the ongoing sustainability conversations with uh, procurement leaders, uh, which as a part of the Infosys procurement confluence uh, we have been conducting over the last few months. So today we have um, Manish Basin, who is the head of sustainable procurement and uh, managing director, Maersk Procurement India with us to share some insights and experience uh, on the sustainable journey in their organization and as well as some personal snippets around the sustainability journey. So let me begin by uh, introducing Manish. Uh, Manish leads a dual portfolio at Maersk. Uh, he heads the global sustainable procurement program at Maersk and uh, operates with a tier one supplier base of uh, 60 to 70,000 suppliers. With Maersk being focused on um, traditional taking the cost out on the uh, in the procurement side, uh, Manish's portfolio was created to shift the mindset towards adopting a more holistic view of total cost and um, with a view to bringing the sustainability factor into the procurement um, lens. He heads the Mumbai office where they work uh, on end-to-end -end procurement execution across all categories in supply chain, um, with several of them being uh, global. So um, with that, um, I would uh, um, like to begin, Manish, uh, by uh, deep diving into your sustainability experience. And uh, maybe you could we could start with um, you telling us a little bit in terms of what are the sustainability efforts that uh, MASC is uh, undertaking and um, how is the program, at what stage the entire say, initiative or the program is and how do you plan to uh, progress it further? No, thank you, Chris, for this opportunity uh, with all of you. Uh, that's really appreciated. So um, sustainability uh, as a whole and our commitment uh, uh, towards the net zero target uh, by 2040 for Musk as a company is a, is a top priority. In fact, it's an enterprise priority for us. And uh, procurement has a key role to play in it, as you were mentioning, with the scale of suppliers that we have to uh, look into and maintain relationships with and engage with. Uh, it's important that we are looking and, and targeting our ESG efforts across an end-to-end -end supply chain, which also includes our own suppliers. So from a procurement standpoint, that is uh, that is key to us and, and an absolute top priority in our uh, company business plan and in our procurement business plan as well. Um, we see procurement's role as acting as a key enabler uh, by, any, by engaging suppliers and improving their uh, ESG capabilities. Procurement can facilitate the creation of an external and reliable ecosystem of suppliers who are committed to the ESG agenda and support the company's goals. And then within procurement, uh, there is uh, there is a need to have uh, a focus uh, on on uh, you know shaping up a global sustainable procurement program, making it a key uh, for the organizations. Uh, and playing a, a, a crucial role in the value chain. Where we are uh, today uh, is that um, our starting point of departure uh, has been low. As you were saying in your introduction, we, uh, we were a company that was very focused uh, on, on a commoditized business in container, uh, in container transport and therefore margins were important and, and our focus was very much on, on taking cost out. Uh, but, uh, you know, with the way the sustainability situation is in the world and the commitments that now we've made, it is uh, super important to us that we that we get going on it. So we have structured our, our overall sustainability program in Maersk across 14 work streams in ESG. Uh, so they would be namely uh, work streams such as decarbonization, uh, HSAC, business resilience, labor and human rights. Uh, diversity and inclusion, responsible tax, and so on and so forth. And uh, our focus is uh, twofold. One is to ensure that uh, we take the right steps uh, uh, to ensure that our contracts and, and our compliance in our contracts from a sustainable procurement standpoint is maintained. So we have a, a, a very tangible metric on ensuring that 
all our suppliers uh, adhere to our supplier code of conduct uh, with regards to all these different ESG aspects and we are targeting achieving 100% on that uh, within the next two years. Um, we also then make it test our suppliers uh, very regularly and we have a target uh, given to our global and frontline organization on that as well. So one part is to ensure that we uh, walk the talk on sustainable compliance in our contracts and in our contract management systems. And then the second part is that we start evolving our supplier relationship management dialogue on uh, on these ESG work streams like decarbonization, HSAC, resilience, labor and human rights uh, violations, and make it a part of our uh, of our regular working to the extent that our uh, our vision is that we want getting captured in our uh, total cost of ownership or our or our you know TCO TVO models very regularly. The last bit, of course, uh, is a, is is internal focused for us where we need to work a lot. So we need to ensure that we build the capabilities of our organization uh, to be able to. Uh, you know, seamlessly integrate ESG as part of the toolbox whenever we are doing negotiations or uh, or the RFQ process or the RFP process and so on. That we do make it a point that ESG is a critical uh, component within that. Uh, and then, of course, internally, uh, this also means that we need to adapt our processes as well. We followed a, a traditional sourcing process, you know, involving collecting data, analyzing it, floating tenders collecting quotes and then doing an online or an offline negotiation. Uh, and now we need to adapt our process to ensure that ESG becomes a part, uh, like, you know, it's a process step in each and every part of the sourcing process that our sourcing managers and our category managers are, uh, are well aware of that. Um, and lastly, of course, you know, with the scale that we are talking about uh, with regards to our tier one suppliers, uh, it is it is an imperative that we need a strong digital foundation in order for us to address these suppliers and to record their data and to record their assessment data and then to monitor the progress and the improvement plans that they're making. We can't do that on Excel and on desktop. So there's, there's also a lot of focus to ensure that we have the right digital foundation in place to, to get that. So that in a nutshell is how we are shaping it up. Uh, uh, we see this as a as a journey uh, and not a not necessarily a, a destination so we have a roadmap in place uh, and then that roadmap we've divided it into phases short term medium term and long term but our goal overall is to is to ensure that we that we get there from a net zero perspective uh, most importantly but also that the other esg parameters are also in line with our internal values and standards in your journey, and typically what we have seen and heard in some of the other organizations, is that the executive sponsorship um, matters a lot. Otherwise, uh, somewhere down the line, people uh, don't take it seriously. And uh, while procurement, we want to push it, uh, but then if the all the stakeholders are not aligned, and typically this is uh, achieved better when there is, say, uh, clear and visible involvement and communication from the uh, board level uh, kind of setup. So uh, is there uh, something like that which uh, Maersk has also done in terms of getting the buy-in from the board level and uh, do you have an executive sponsor at the board level who is uh, behind this initiative? Yes, so uh, uh, our CEO of Fleet and Strategic Brands is the executive sponsor for uh, the sustainable procurement initiative it is anchored at the highest level in our executive leadership team in musk and uh, very uh, rigorously tracked and monitored as well there in terms of progress and and bottleneck resolution uh, and so on and then uh, besides that uh, in the procurement leadership team this is uh, a priority across the board uh, eventually success on driving sustainability in procurement uh, the way we see it is that the real success is when it gets uh, seamlessly anchored at a category level right across the board that uh, that we shouldn't have uh, you know it being treated as a exclusive program that needs to be managed and and so on it should just be a part of the sourcing toolbox of the category management toolbox 
and something that uh, becomes a part of day-to-day -day working and day-to-day -day buying. Uh, so various layers of governance established. We have you know steer cores and 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 a, and a form of governance established. But at the highest level, it is indeed our our executive leadership team that uh, that is taking an interest in owning and driving it. Um, so uh, what about the effort to bring in the other stakeholders on board? And uh, was that, um, is it a journey still or the people are completely on board and it is only about implementation? No, I mean, um, the short answer is that uh, there is quite good and quite positive buy-in from across our, uh, our global stakeholder landscape on this. There are some reasons for it. Um, first of all, um, our customers are demanding an increased focus on sustainability across the end-to-end -end supply chain. So it's an obligation that we have towards our, our customers. And that is something, uh, you know, as all companies do, we take very, very seriously. So that brings about a natural stakeholder buy-in. But besides that, uh, it's not just the state, it's not just the customers, but also our, uh, uh, you know, our, uh, there's a bit of a regulatory uh, environment around this as well, particularly in Europe. For example, Germany has this year passed its due diligence uh, laws to come into effect in 2023. So, you know, if a country passes a law. On, on certain ESG parameters, then it's not an option. It's not up for discussion. We need to adapt to that, uh, and we need to find solutions around it. And the EU due diligence uh, will also kick in in 2024. Uh, Europe may be a prime mover in it, but eventually we will see the whole world uh, moving into its own due diligence norms and so on, because that's how uh, sustainability is today. It is a burning platform across the world. So. There are customer expectations, there are regulator expectations, and lastly, from a financial standpoint, there are also investor expectations as well. Our shareholders, our investors, they expect us to take action on this. We are uh, uh, one of the largest uh, shipping companies in the world. Now we have a very expanding landside footprint as well. So there is a lot of uh, uh, trade that we are facilitating, and that naturally has an impact on on a lot of the ESG parameters. So it is our responsibility to take the lead to show results on it. So all these factors, uh, I think, lead to universal buy-in across the stakeholder landscape, frankly, across the organization. Um, and besides that, I think, uh, you know, we, like I mentioned earlier, we do have a strong governance and a sponsorship framework in place as well. Uh, which is not necessarily to act as an escalation mechanism, but I think that also inspires and motivates people to uh, to drive the actions with a with a needed sense of urgency. Most of the situations, the clients uh, typically say that um, uh, the product or service they are buying that the price of that should not go up, and yet you should you have to maintain or comply with all the uh, sustainable practices. So is that something which uh, in your uh, situation also in your business, um, is that the same situation that customers expect prices to reduce uh, the prices to them? And yet uh, they expect that uh, the um, sustainable practices have to be maintained. And is there a challenge in that more importantly? Um, I don't think we can isolate the ESG impact on its own for either a cost reduction or a cost increase. Uh, barometer because uh, you know as all of us in the procurement community know TCO is very complex uh, so when you reach that negotiation and when you reach that trade-off discussion uh, balances can be found in multiple ways uh, it's not necessary it's not always necessary that we look at uh, you know just uh, the cost reduction or cost increase in percentage terms in these days of high inflation for example uh, you know, early payment mechanisms is something that a lot of suppliers are appreciating. So that's one trade-off parameter that, that can be played. So I'm a very optimistic person on this part. I think, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, we are, uh, neither our suppliers uh, nor our customers see this as a, as, as a problem for one company to solve or one entity to solve. Uh, my sense is when I speak to suppliers and the little interaction we have with customers that everybody sees this as a global agenda and a global problem, and they want to be a part of the solution. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that one party has to compensate more than the other. Uh, but we need to find that right balance in the trade-offs. And, and that brings me back to my, my earlier point. That, that is where our focus is very high on capability building. Because we want our global procurement team to be well aware of these trade-offs and, and not enter you know, discussions where we, we end up like on, on, on a different page, right, in terms of uh, like having black and white discussions on you can only have this if you give me this. Uh, and particularly some of our categories, which, you know, warehousing, customs house, brokerage, terminal services, huge multi-million dollar spends, which, which are very complex in nature. So I think there is room for, for a good and healthy and a constructive trade-off discussion here, both with our suppliers and our customers. We are looking increasingly at companies evaluating a, a China plus uh, sourcing model you know, they uh, reducing dependence on one key source and looking at other macroeconomic geographies uh, to to do their sourcings from. Uh, we are in a high inflationary environment, so you know, input costs and and so on are increasing. So we are trying to drive uh, a sustainability agenda in an environment which is not. Uh, financially uh, cooperative, <laughs> if I can use that word, uh, uh, with regards to us doing large scale investments and so on. So there, there has to be, I think, two, you know, two ways empathy on this. We need to understand what the complications are on the supplier side. The supplier needs to understand the complications on the buyer side. And that's where an SRM framework is going to be critical because uh, We've all been in procurement for long and, and we know that all negotiations hinge a lot on relationships eventually. There is no template or boilerplate that, that we can follow. Uh, the e-auctions is a good out for uh, the competitive markets where you can get you know, 10, 15 vendors together. But when you reach the complex categories, either in technology or consulting or terminals in our cases, then or, or sometimes dealing with governments, uh, in in certain cases, then a lot hinges on on the relationship part, uh, and I think the, the the companies that get the SRM framework spot on, uh, get the platform digital platform part sorted, and uh, have ESG anchored at the highest level in the organization. I I do believe those are the companies that will deliver successfully on this agenda and set an example for the others. Um, on you mentioned about capability building and uh, you know embedding sustainable practices into the process. So, uh, from a capability building, is it about uh, training or is it hiring a, a completely different skill set? Uh, how are you and going about it, and what exactly are the specific some of the specific things that you are doing on capability building? It's a combination of both. Um, there are a few skill sets that we do need to uh, acquire from the outside. Uh, we need to respect the fact that there are people out there who probably know more than us on certain areas, and and uh, we may need to acquire that talent and that skill externally and and learn from them uh, when when they join us. Uh, and then the second part is that uh, there has to be, uh, th there are two aspects to the training because one is that we, uh, we've begun now with a very basic course on sustainability and procurement and what does it mean and so on. But eventually our goal is to embed sustainability and ESG into each training on its own because we run a, a training program for sourcing concepts and techniques. We run a training program for category management excellence, for supply chain management excellence, for digital excellence, so on and so forth, as, as all companies do. So we don't want sustainability to be looked at as a separate training package that you just you know check a box and, and move ahead. We have We want our people to be trained on what does it mean for sustainability from a category management standpoint in your particular category. What does sustainability mean from a digital standpoint, from an e-auction standpoint, uh, you know, from an automation standpoint? It, it could be anything and, and everything there. So we want to see it embedded structurally across our procurement process on an end-to-end -end manner. Uh, and that's 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 part of what my role is, is to structure a program that allows us to embed it over the next two to three years so that uh, our category managers can 
can can stand alone and integrate ESG into the agenda without having some central guidance or uh, or anything uh, like that coming separately. So at the moment we are pursuing some training programs on a basic level, but eventually we will scale them up. Uh, and then uh, we will make sure that the curriculum on each of our existing trainings has sustainability and ESG incorporated into them. Any say initiative around uh, the supplier communication, any workshops or any specific ones, or it is during the RFP processes that that is taken care so, of. So um, it's you know it, it's difficult to in a very uh, generic manner because we have some suppliers who are multi-billion dollar enterprises in their own right. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I could look at some IT uh, or, or technology suppliers to us uh, who are huge companies in their in their own right. And uh, uh, they have actually taken the initiative like we have and nominated a, a sustainable procurement representative from their side or a commercial sustainable representative from their side to interact with us and, and participate with us. So our sense is that uh, that with the large companies, uh, there is common ground and everybody is more or less structuring themselves accordingly so that counterparts uh, can meet and, and discuss the relevant forums across the board. Then when you come to the to the medium sized companies there, we encounter that the intent is there uh, that they want to do the right things, but they are lacking the structure. Uh, so they need our support and, and they need our guidance and, and a bit of hand holding on that, which we are uh, very committed to giving. And when you uh, really boil it down to, uh, you know, to the uh, to the segments where uh, small suppliers, you know, uh, mom and pop type uh, stores or ad hoc trucking vendors there uh, probably we we see the need to build a community there and to get a, a larger message across the board uh, for the moment our focus is on is on high risk high impact categories and geographies that's how we've segmented our supplier base uh, but yes for as as we work ourselves down the value chain uh, we do uh, foresee the need to 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 become to help first of all build a community where sustainability gets discussed and common best practices and so on are shared and secondly also then from uh, from whatever we can do to support as a leading logistics company to to send the right message and and uh, guidance on tools and and so on that are available for suppliers to use and uh, and positively impact our agenda of the uh, structure of uh, the procurement organization, uh, do you think that will need to change in any manner or it is just the capability and knowledge building that should be good enough? I, th I think skill sets will keep changing in the procurement organization. I, In fact, I think they are already changing. Uh, when I started my career, I think um, uh, you know, like knowing e-sourcing was a very key differentiator in, in those days. And I'm talking 14, 15 years back. So if you had experience of, of running an, an e-auction engine, uh, you were in uh, hot demand and your skills were appreciated because you knew online negotiation. That was the that was the new trend back then. And today, I think online negotiation has just become bread and butter. Uh, every procurement professional in the world uh, knows you know how to deal with a competitive market and how to deal with a monopolistic market so i think that's good news for procurement that the skill sets have evolved over the years now the next level of skill sets are going to be centered around uh, uh, around esg how uh, procurement professionals are able to uh, adapt esg into our ways of working into our processes uh, and and most most importantly in our supplier dialogues, be it on negotiations or, or just generally otherwise in supplier relationship management, those skill sets will keep changing. Um, in order to facilitate that skill set change, I, I do see the need for sustainable procurement functions uh, that will come up as a form of a central function, as most companies have right now uh, that drive this program. Um, very similar actually to the way a global e-sourcing program was being driven 15 years ago where you had a like a central head of e-procurement 
which was a very big position uh, back then and 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 they helped you know embed e procurement across the process i see that same uh, I, I see that same strategy ongoing and and i also think like in order for us to drive this it will be a complementary skill set of esg with with uh, a digital mindset i think it's going to be very difficult for companies to achieve this uh, from the comfort level of their excel sheet and and their desktop computer i i just don't see that happening i think if we are talking monitoring emission control across a large supplier base or monitoring uh, safety and uh, you know fatalities data or you know labor and human rights violations and so on and so forth we will need a combination where uh, procurement professionals are able to do the sourcing process do the negotiation uh, factor in esg everywhere and then finally you know use a digital platform to monitor compliance and improvement plans because the key is going to be improvement there will be gaps i think we all know that uh, even the suppliers know that but then what do we do with those gaps that's where the srm framework needs to kick in we need to have improvement plans monthly quarterly uh, we need to have dialogues with our suppliers on why are they not meeting their goals and so on and all of that will need a digital mindset as well um, so i think uh, i i do see the skill sets evolving but i also see um, a sustainable procurement function being needed particularly in large enterprises in order to facilitate and structure this entire program this on digital uh, which you mentioned uh, is extremely important because this will need a huge amount of uh, inputs from uh, both the external partners and as well as internally to monitor and report out and also to find out where what needs to change and so on so uh, i think that uh, can't be done without a digital initiative uh, being also parallelly uh, or being the uh, base on which this is driven i think the other uh, uh, point that you made is also important around that uh, so far in procurement even in some of the large organizations barring some say strategic suppliers srm the supplier relationship management part hasn't got the uh, attention that it deserves and uh, probably with um, the sustainability and risk uh, on a digital platform uh, hopefully that will lead to a srm also being embedded as a you know key element of the overall procurement specifically like when we uh, think of uh, you know mayersk as a shipping company uh, and shipping and logistics uh typically uh, like in the usual uh, manufacturing organizations uh, you know esg is probably easier to envisage saying that okay whatever materials you buy and so on or services you buy you uh, do these things from a in a uh, shipping industry uh, what would be the the top say spend areas or uh, you know areas of focus Uh, where you would uh, be doing this so for us uh, i mean we are uh, we we kicked off a transformation actually in 2016 or or late 2016 early 2017 where we decided to transform ourselves from a shipping company to an integrated logistics provider which in in simple terms means that we decided to venture onto land side uh, services as well uh, you know like warehousing and trucking and so on. but uh, our our big spend areas are are very much centered around ocean and land side categories we also uh, have our own uh, uh, you know port terminal company as well called apm terminals so these are our primary businesses but mersk is is still a, a vast kind of a conglomerate in in many ways so we do have our own container company in china as well uh, uh, so we have some brands we have a towage company as well and so but our our major categories are centered around ocean and land side services so typically uh, at each port um, you have terminals like you have railway terminals you have you know port terminals as well and uh, those port terminals are leased out for a certain period of time a concession agreement is signed uh, so that probably is our our biggest spend category uh, then come the associated uh capex and opex related to operating that terminal so we need cranes 
we need uh, boxes you know uh, and so on and so forth then of course our vessels docking in uh, they need you know fuel which is a, uh, which is a huge uh, spend for us uh, and then if we get into the vessel it opens up a pandora's box for us in categories because then we have a crew there and the crew needs consumables and uh, and so on and so forth uh, if you get into the technicalities of shipping you know as you enter the port the tide becomes low so the vessel can't actually enter so you need tugboats so you get into the whole towage category where you need the tugboats to pull the vessel right up to the gantry um so that's the whole ocean side of it and then once the box is unloaded then the box has to be stored somewhere in a warehouse typically so there's a spend associated with that and then of course it's trucked either to a wholesaler or to a retailer or sometimes there's a last mile delivery associated with it in the western countries uh, where trucking and rail is a costly venture then there's also a barge uh, capability or barge spend as well so essentially i mean there, there is an ocean leg where where we have big categories and terminals and ports and then there's a land side uh, leg where we have intermodal uh, as our biggest uh, category and then some related categories on customs house brokerage and, and so on and so forth so those are typically the spends we deal with which is why decarbonization is a huge focus area for us because most of our spends directly you know influence the fuel consumption in some way or another so that's where uh, we we really within the esg work streams we prioritize decarbonization um, you know for impact uh, as a top priority I think around fuel as well uh, or that is something which is uh, like the alternative fuels which is a big topic around the world uh, is there also but then that is uh, because for automobiles and all probably it is easier to think yeah. but when we are talking of large vessels and ocean going uh, vessels probably but is there something like that which is uh, in the offing or yeah uh, so not what yet? we've encountered and and we took a decision on it eventually what we encountered was that it's a chicken and egg situation so we can't buy uh, you know eco friendly vessels because there's no fuel available and there's no fuel available because nobody is buying any eco friendly vessel so it was a chicken and egg situation and we eventually took a decision we we've, we've placed an order for a large fleet of eco friendly vessels and we have you know in a way thrown the gauntlet to the market to say now there are vessels now give us the the fuel uh, so that's one big step we we have taken uh, on- is that uh, is that something you would call pioneering that you are one of the first large shipping companies to really order a fleet of eco-friendly vessels we, we know our competitors are also thinking on the same lines but i think uh, we have managed to move swiftly on it uh, okay. i i do believe eventually the industry will follow uh, so fuel um, supply is is a complication but then you know somebody needs to take the first step and and i think this is a good first step with regards to trucking um, you know we've taken some steps notably recently in india actually where i am based where we have uh, agreed with some of our trucking suppliers to to the use of electric vehicles uh, oh. and uh, and and that has been a, a very good collaboration both with the suppliers as well as with the customers uh, to do a pilot to use it to figure out what the benefits are what the challenges are and then we hope to scale it up and then we've also replicated the same in north america and a few other geographies as well so these are some steps we are taking on the, on the fuel side uh, is there any personal changes uh, has this whole sustainability topic uh, impacted um, like say interactions with the rest of the family or in the for example in my case uh, you know we don't use any plastic bottles at home now and uh, uh, you know it's only the metal bottles that are there in fact we also have the urban ones as well the gada and surai kind of things as well and um, so um, have you seen anything similar and we have also become much more conscious about uh, you know like so you carry a bag to the when you go to the uh, market and so on 
So have you seen something like that happening individually at an individual level? Yeah, well? definitely. I, I, I think this, uh, the, re the big reason for me to take up this role was that uh, I am genuinely very concerned and it's a very cliched thing to say because I think a lot of people say it, but I'm genuinely very concerned as to what planet are we going to leave behind for our future generations and, and particularly, you know, like many others, I have children and uh, I, I think, you know, like uh, as I, as i sometimes joke with my children that you know i i've had my fun time with the earth uh, <laughs> you know i grew up at a time when like really this was not even on the agenda uh, and i'm i'm really sorry that you know uh, that that they are not getting more of what what my generation got so whatever it is that we can do to leave behind a healthy planet for them that is something that uh, that, that is really moves me as an individual and really was the reason why I, I took up the role in spite of being a like a you know basically a strategic sourcing professional for for most of my life um and then the the changes do come in right as as you were also mentioning chris that uh, you know i i have started uh, becoming more and more passionate like about electric cars uh it was something I must admit I, I used to view with some cynicism two years ago because I felt like, you know, what will I do with an electric car if, if the charge runs out and, and these kind of things. But I am noticing more and more electric cars being bought and, and you know, uh, I was a part of, I was very privileged that the, my housing society asked me to, uh, to help facilitate electric chargers in the society because a lot of them were interested in that. So... I think that's that's something positive to see, and then, of course, the little things with turning the lights off and the and the fans off and so on, that is coming more uh, more consciously to us. I, I don't know how much difference it makes to the coal consumption that I put off my the lights in my living room, but I I, I do feel we we should just do that. So, the behavioral uh, changes are becoming more instinctive and more intuitive, and my commitment uh, at least my my car is now like almost seven years old so it's i need to turn it around i think next year and my commitment is uh, to myself is that i would i will go for an electric car and then i'll uh, i'll figure it out with regards to the charging points uh, i mean thank you very much this was a, a very i would say a lot of interesting uh, insights that uh, you brought out and um, uh, some of them i would say and also to know about some of the pioneering things uh, uh, which your company is doing and some of your thoughts around it. Uh, I think this would be very useful to the community, the procurement community at large to know about uh, how to go about some of these initiatives um, to learn from what you have said and what they could do uh, and the points to emphasize on like say the digital and the, uh, the skill upliftment etc that you mentioned. So hopefully um, uh, this will be a very useful uh, session for uh, the uh, the community when we publish this. So thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, your thoughts and your. Uh, thank you, thank you for the opportunity.